Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 103, with me, your host, Agostino. How are you guys doing? How are you? How are you feeling? Hope you had a great weekend. Um, did you get up to anything fun? Anything naughty? Do you see some friends? Meet any old friends? Did you make some new friends? When I mean friends, I mean, you know, friends. Whatever you guys did out there, I hope you guys had a great weekend. Um, I did not have such a great weekend. I had a pretty mundane and slow weekend. Probably the slowest weekend I've had of my entire adult life. Um, as you are well aware, I've been suffering from the tonsillitis, you know, a little um, hmm, virus of the throat that ends up, um, you know, you have bacteria in your throat that ends up infecting a gland in your esophagus when it gets inflamed and there's pus all over it, which then sends you into a cold fever shock and you start shivering and you have to then go on a course of antibiotics that I'm now taking for the last um, 10, oh no, I'm, took, I'm taking for the last seven days. Um, seven days is up on Tuesday, so I should be off it. Um, yeah, but it's been an interesting, interesting experience, you know? Like I mentioned, I think in the last episode, um, sicknesses, especially for men, have this weird debilitating effect in it where like you feel as if you're gonna die, right? I don't think guys take being ill too too well. I think um, whenever a guy is ill, especially in his um, adult life or <clears throat> he's uh, taken down by some sort of sickness, he starts to appreciate how amazing women are. You know, they they give birth. You know, uh, a child comes out of their vagina. Um, they have uh, monthly menstrual cycles. Uh, for some girls, they get they have excruciating pain in the abdomen. Right. Um, so they have these con they have these constant bouts of like um internal pain where their body is kind of flushing out toxins and kind of repairing itself right and us guys by the mo for the most part guys I don't know I don't know if you know this or if you're if you have friends like this but for the most part most of the guys I know don't usually get sick all the time it's usually kind of a girl thing I don't know why don't get me wrong maybe girls are more susceptible to changes of the weather and stuff. And plus their menstrual cycle kind of maybe throws them off. And sometimes if the girl's on a pill, maybe her defenses will be down. But for the most part, you don't really hear of guys being overly sickly. But when they are overly sickly, boy, do we complain. Um, and I was unfortunately one of those annoying complaining people when I was ill. Which I'm never like that when I'm not ill, to be honest. So maybe um, the old uh, whinger that's buried deep, deep inside of me kind of finally festered its way out. And kind of... <laughs> You know what I mean? Kind of crawled out of me. But now it's all it's all gone now. I'm on the mend a little bit. Um, so much so that I went for my first run this morning. My first run this morning. In what, seven days? So it's been an entire week. I've not been running. The last run I did when I checked my phone was last Monday. It was last week. No, last week Monday. So it's been an entire seven days without running. So um which has been good. I I'm not I'm, I always take these little sicknesses things as like a good indication of some sort of of a of a some sort of foreshadowing or a warning of some sort of type, right? Um, that's telling you to kind of take it easy, because you don't. I don't usually take it easy, so maybe it's your body saying, "Hey, relax, stop being a dickhead, and have a breather." And I'm I'm all right. I'm all right to under to listen to that message. So maybe that might be what it, what the whole point of this whole sickness thing is. And if that is the case, then so be it. So um, seven days really did help. I, I feel a lot more refreshed now. I feel recharged. I feel ready to go. And yeah, I'm in much better spirits now. Um, I'm thinking of changing my training schedule a little bit. So at the moment, I'm doing six days, um, um, which is usually Monday to Saturday. And I have a Sunday off. But I think I'm now just going to concentrate on doing Monday to Friday and have two complete days off of not doing any workout at all, not doing any push-ups, not doing any sit-ups, nothing. Just completely letting my body recover. If anything, I might do some like um, yoga-y kind of stuff with um, Mobility Wad, this service that I use online where you get these daily videos that you run through that kind of helps you to do mobility exercises so you can get loads of, so you can kind of increase your range of motion when you go down in squats, when you go down and touch your knees, when you kind of pull your arm behind your back. So if you, you can check that out too at mobilitywad.com. You can get like a, I think it's a 30 day free trial and then it's like $10 um, per a month, but it's a really handy service. So I might just do that on a Saturday, Sunday, but I feel like I'm going to just concentrate on doing Monday to Friday, um, working out as hard as I can in, th in that period of time and then taking the, those two days off because balancing, full, having a full-time job, balancing making a podcast, balancing DJing, balancing doing all the other things I'm doing outside of work and working out six days a week, I think might have led to my defenses being down and just having a bit of an, in, um, an internal uh, crash 
which then resulted in me having tonsillitis. I think so anyway. Again, I'm, I'm maybe I'm not hypothesizing about it too much, and it might just be a fact, a factor, a case of like, look, you're gonna get tonsillitis um, here and there along the period of your life. It's just those things that happen. But I'm ge- I'm I'm generally quite healthy in my eating. You know, I, I eat health he- as healthy as I can. <clears throat> Um, so I don't know what that could have. Been. I don't think it's to do with the food. It might just been again. It might just be like a. It might be a stress thing, because I don't really show any outwardly. I, I'm not really an outwardly stressful person. Like I'm not anxiety driven. I don't shake and shit. I don't get nervous about things. I'm very calm, for the most part. Very level headed. But sometimes it. But sometimes I do think to myself, Am I like that, or am I just telling myself I'm like that? So it might just be like a little internal lie that I'm telling myself. But then inside of inside, there's this like erupting volcano. And then, um, you know, in it might have just erupted over the last seven days, which then caused the tonsillitis. But apart from that, you know, I'm on the mend. Like I said, I got my antibiotics. I had a run this morning. I felt really good. I felt really strong. Um, I'm sure the seven days of uh, rest did help. And now onwards and upwards. So yeah, episode number one and three. Let's get it cracking. So um, over the weekend as well, I, I've been concentrating about make. I've been kind of reorganizing my content, what I want to do, where I want to put things. Um, I figured out I want to do a new mix series. I'm probably going to start um, this week. I'm going to start a mix series from Saturday to Sunday, right? And I've got this idea of setting up like a fake uh, club. So um, I might just call the club Labertees or something or whatever, because I've always because that's the night that I do in uh, Heathcote the Star. But I'm set. I'm thinking of setting up like a fake a mix series based on the fake club. So it'll be like a recorded in, in situ of the club. And then I'll be playing, you know, a little kind of an hour, an hour and a half of music that I'll kind of upload. And the whole idea behind it is to kind of like give people something to play when they're getting ready to go out on a Thursday, on a Friday, on a Saturday. I think so. I might do it or just do it Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I, might, I don't know, but I'm thinking about doing that as a mixed series. Um, I'm also thinking about um, uploading a whole, hell of a bunch more uh, mixes on Mixcloud. It looks like Mixcloud is probably the way to go with things because um, SoundCloud they do uh, they do have a tendency of of, put, of tearing I mean of pulling down your um your mixes on there. Mixcloud doesn't they, they they're a bit um I don't know why they allow they allow you to put their stuff on there more copyright material but that happens a lot. Um, I'm thinking about changing my overall website design um or hosting. At the moment, it's hosted on Tumblr, but I can't seem to get videos to play on the landing page. So I'll need a, a new website, a new hosting platform that allows me to play videos on the landing page. So I'm going to get that sorted out soon. Um, I'm thinking about maybe starting a weekly newsletter. Um, at the moment, it's probably not the greatest idea because I haven't really been keeping up to date with, update, um, with updating my personal blog. I've not been doing that daily, so to start a newsletter might not be the best idea. So I might actually just go for low hanging, lowest hanging fruit. Make sure I start um, posting daily on my blog, which is defaultgoon.net or defaultgoon.com. Sorry, check that out, check that out, check that out. And then um, once I get into the rhythm of doing that, um, then I will start um, maybe thinking of doing a newsletter because there's, there's this um, there's this website. I think it's called uh, Stubsack or Shubsack. What's it called? There's a website where you can do newsletters and you can get paid for making newsletters. It's called, yeah, this is what it's called. It's called uh, Substack. I'm going to quickly put it up on the screen for you guys can see it here. There's this web, there's this newsletter called uh, Famous People, which is, you know, really, really cool. Mm. So, yeah, there's a website called Substack where you can go and you can kind of like um, make a newsletter, right? And then people can subscribe to it and they can kind of like pay you a monthly fee newsletter you can make so it's kind of like a blog but kind of a newsletter form you can kind of see it here this is a, a, a this is a newsletter called famous people where these girls go out and what's the byline they say um who do, who do you um who do you know here party reviews by two adult women who don't know anyone at all so this is quite a cool little um website so i might just do something like that as well and what other content ideas i've been thinking about over the weekend do, 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 do. Um, it seems like the clips on YouTube are working a lot better than the actual podcast, which is funny, which I, makes more sense anyway, because I'm usually rambling on here on the podcast uh, version of it for about an hour or so. But then whenever I put the episodes up on YouTube and I just clip them up, so I just take little clips and put them up on YouTube, they, they perform a lot better than the actual long episodes. So I'm sure people tend to like steer away from watching hours of people just sitting down and talking. But I love it really, personally. I'm a big fan of watching um, podcasts on YouTube, but I think for the most part, people would like to see little clips, which is why most big podcast, most podcast, most big podcast people on YouTube, like the H3H, the Joe Rogans, the Fire and the Kid, um, who else is another one? Uh, your mum's house most of them have they either have a second channel that uploads clips or they upload clips from their main uh webs main um thing onto youtube 
which I'm going to do, I think, very, very soon. And again, if anyone out there who's like, you know, wants to get involved or wants to, you know, start doing things in the whole podcast realm, that's a good idea as well to offer your services. If, you've, if, you're, if there's a podcast that you follow and there's things that, and you want, and you want to help them out and making clips, that's what you're going to do. Set up, set up a channel for them, cut the clips up and upload them and just show them with everything that you're doing. I'm sure they'll be super stoked on it. That's a really good way to go about it. But I've been doing it myself quite easily. You can do it online using the YouTube app. And other services such as this website called HessyTube that allows you to kind of clip the little um, segments of your show. At the moment, the clips I'm uploading are still a little bit too long. They're sometimes a bit 8 to 14 minutes. I'm just going to try and get them under 8 minutes long and try and test them. Um, some t- test a clip that's 4 minutes, test a clip that's 8 minutes and try and get it uploaded too. And then once I make my return to Instagram, start making little clips that are a minute long that I can upload onto Instagram too. So I kind of just use Instagram as another platform to kind of share content. But I'm not sure if I want to do that, if I want to make Instagram more of a curated thing or... It depends anyway. We'll see how we approach it. But loads of different content ideas I've been thinking about in terms of an approach. Um, what else? And that's about it for the most part. That's been the most um, entrepreneurial ideas I've had floating around in my head. Um, and yeah, try and get it going, man. I'm, you know, I'm feeling, again, you feel a little bit tender after you get sick, man. You start contemplating things, you know. Am I going too hard? Am I not going hard enough? But, you know. I'm going to try and pull back on a few things and then try and pull forward on a few other things. And hopefully, 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 um, I'll get to where I need to get to. Um, anyway, let's crack on with the topics because this will be a quick one because I've got a zip out, zip, zip, zoom. I'm going to do a new um, commute to work this today because I want to read, I want to smash through some books I haven't really uh, smashed through just yet. I've got how many books here? I've got two books I need to bang through. So I've got uh, Barbarian Days, A Surfing Life by William Finnegan, which is that one there. And I've got um, Murder Machine by Gene Mustaine and Jerry Capici, which is a fucking terrifying read. Um, it's about, obviously, it's about the mob, the kind of, um, the beginnings of the mob in New York, Sicilian mob, to be precise. It's a very, very, very enthralling book, but it's not the greatest book to read before bed. I read it the other day over the weekend when I was before I went to sleep and I had the, whole, the worst nightmare in the world. And you know what I read just before I went to bed? I read a story about these guys uh, murdering uh, a fellow, uh, an ex kind of accomplice of theirs and cutting his body up into parts and then dumping it underneath a building somewhere. So I guess that's probably might, it might have led to me having a horrible dream. But yeah, I need to smash through these books. So <coughs> I'm going to take, take the bus today. You don't, I usually take the train, but I'm going to take the bus today. It's about um, an hour or it's about 40 minutes there and back so I can smash through these books and get them all done. Because I remember the last time I used to work in Shoreditch. I used to usually take the buses and smash through books so quickly. Especially even just even just reading books on Monday to Friday, I could back, I could finish books so really really quick. Because that's like a, that's basically an hour that like back and forth that you're reading books and smashing them through. And you don't need that long to to smash through books um, on the bus as well. No disruptions. The only thing about it, you you get a bit queasy when you're moving buses moving around and stuff. But I'll figure that out. Anyways. Um, What's next on this topic? Oh, you know what I also thought as well? I've been thinking, right, that construction pants are going to come back in. Well, not come back in. I think construction pants are in our next wave. Why? Because I think they're going to work really well with these Balenciaga Triple S's that I have, right? See these shoes that I have? I don't really wear them that often now because they're not that comfortable. Um, because they're probably a size too small. They probably should have been a 45, but, you know, hey-ho, c'est la vie. You live and learn. But I've got these Balenciaga Triple S's. And I'm going to get a pair of construction pants, right? So these two triple S's, I think are going to work really, 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 really well with these construction pants. I'm going to quickly show you this before I jump into the topics. Because I think this might be the next wave. I don't know why, but I've got a feeling about it. Maybe because I, I live in an area where I'm always seeing loads of construction um, workers or handymen working around the street. But I think this might be the next wave. I'm honestly, honestly saying this. I know this might sound weird and everyone's going to say, oh my God, I'm talking about it. Else. But hold on, hold on a minute, right? So, get this up on the screen. Hopefully you guys can see this. But yeah, you see these, see these trousers, right? These trousers, I think, are going to be the next wave. And if you don't know what these trousers are, if you've seen the uh, construction workers w- walking around town, you know the trousers they have where the front pockets are kind of outside it, so you can kind of put your tools and they don't need to kind of be stuffed against your leg. It's, there's really cool design nods on it. They've got like a reinforced knee, so when you go on the floor, it doesn't hurt your knees. Loads of really cool bits about that make it really, really amazing. But I think these are going to be the next wave. I'm on to, I don't know who's going to do it first. Hopefully, I might do it first <coughs> and kill everybody. But I think construction pants 
mixing with combat pants were going to be the next wave. I'm honestly on it. And I'm going to, and I think these, uh, with a little bit of a wider, um, what do you call it? Cuff or the, what's the bottom of the jean cord? Anyway, whatever that is, a little bit wider, so it kind of covers more of the of the Balenciaga triple S's or kind of chunky shoes is the way forward. I need to just find the right pair that I need to get. But I honestly think these are going to be the next wave. Like, honestly, that those colors already are kind of, you know, the black neon and sort of like the um, with the fluorescent strip around them. Those are already kind of colors are already in right now, especially with the whole 90s revival happening in fashion at the moment. But yeah, so I think like this, like construction pants are definitely the way forward because you can definitely see, you can definitely see like a pair of construction pants, like kind of style trousers being made by a brand like Double Taps or like, you know, Neighborhood or something, you know, the kind of like, you know, everyday man sort of like kind of style trouser, but they look fucking banging. So I'm definitely going to, uh, think of a way of maybe designing my own or trying to get a pair and maybe editing them a little bit but i think this is definitely the wave the only thing i'd, I'd think of, of changing is maybe again is the um, what would you call it is a crotch so they so they sag a little bit better <clears throat> these kind of obviously fit like more like trousers as you can see like you know I, i've got a picture up here now with a pair of construction pants and the guy's wearing them it's got the kind of the pockets i like where they sort of like outside of the actual pockets they've got like a little pouch and you can kind of stuff your tools in but they they just feel like regular trousers. It'd be good if I could try and get like you know, try and get them to kind of sag a little bit better here, so they kind of have a little bit of a drop crotch. I think they'll look amazing. So kind of a minimal drop crotch on it, I think will look really really cool. So yeah, that's my next wave. I'm thinking of doing, which would be quite cool. You know, imagine launching a fashion brand just on on the back of trousers first, and kind of building your way up on it. Because people usually start with with uh, hoodies and stuff, right? But I'm assuming trousers would be quite difficult because they're cut and sew, which is why people probably go for hoodies because it's just you know. It's just a plain blank gildan, but I'm going to start there. I think so. That's my lane to go. But anyway, jump into the topics quickly because i got a jet, jet, jet. Um, Final Friday alibi. So um, as you guys might not be, or be aware or are aware, the other day I had the pleasure of DJing at the alibi. So this is previous previous to me fe um, falling sick and having tonsillitis. I ended up DJing at the alibi for the Final Friday. And it was a great set. I had a good time. As I mentioned previously, it was all nice and a bit emotional to kind of, you know, finally put a, a pin uh, at the end of a really um, interesting journey with the Alibi and East London in general, right? I've had a lot of ups and downs um, promoting events there, DJing there, falling out of people, falling in people, falling in love with people. And it's always been, you know, but it's nice to kind of finally be able to put a closer chapter and feel a little bit um, whole on the inside because I was feeling a little bit empty. No, but um, that, it was a good, it was a good night. I really enjoyed it. And like I said, I, I really enjoyed the fact that I was able to play a set that no one else could play there or no one else wanted to play. Everyone was playing, you know, standard house and techno shit. I went in there and played all my disco, disco, disco. So that was fucking good and a lot of good fun. But that aside, um, I, when I was in there DJing, I decided to, or the, actually the week when I was sick, I was kind of contemplating shit and looking at stuff and watching documentaries and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, I started to realize, like, you know what? I don't actually have any pictures of me DJing, like none. I have one picture someone took of me when I was DJing at some club in Soho, right? But I don't really count that because it's a bit shit. And it's like, you know, I was back in the day when I, when I was just playing in these horrible Mayfair clubs um, just to kind of get my reps up and shit. But, you know, never again. Um, so I don't really have actual pictures of me DJing in cool places. Um, so thankfully, I had a look around. I'm not actually on Instagram at the moment, but you can log in through web or you can kind of check. You can't just search without logging in through web. So I just searched the alibi quickly and I just, you know, you can search by location on Instagram and I stumbled upon a picture of me DJing. So I've got actual picture of me in the wild playing music that I'm really, really chuffed about and super happy that um, this guy was able to take a picture of that. I wish I could give him credit, but... I forgot the name of the dude that took a picture of it, so please excuse me. But I'm going to get it up on your screen so you guys can see. <clears throat> bada bing, bada boom. So yeah, I got, finally got a picture of me DJing in the wild, and it looks amazing, if I may say so myself. So this is this is I DJing at the Alibi, the, like, the final Friday there. As you can see, I'm playing on CDJs, and I have no idea what I'm going to play next. <laughs> That's the face of pure, pure confusion. So I've got my do-rag on and my tie-dye shirt, as per usual. Just, you know, just playing the disco beats. And, you know, um, it was a fun occasion, man. Like, I, I like, I, I like, um, I like always, I like fuck, I like fucking up people's expectations. You know, I like rocking up, like looking the way I do with a do-rag on and a tie-dye metal t-shirt and then just playing an entire, an entirely, um, an entire 70s to 80s disco set. You know what I mean? Everyone's like, whoa, what the fuck is this? He's playing ABBA. It's like, yeah, bitch. Music has, um, 
music is music is like that, isn't it? You don't know what you're gonna get really. You can't really you can never assume what anyone's into just by looking at them. That's uh you know, music is just things that you put into your head phones and play out loud, you know? It doesn't really need you don't really need to have an outfit or anything, you know. That's why I kind of always kind of had a bit of a disdain sometimes when I used to go to sometimes metal shows and you just see guys there who all look the same basically. It's like no, just because you like a band doesn't mean you all have to dress the same. It's a bit weird, but I guess you know, maybe the strength in numbers and you wanna feel like you have a little community with you. But yeah, that's the picture of me DJing at Lullaby. I'm super chuffed I have one at least. And then on top of that, I also managed to record a little bit of the set that I played, um, which I have now available on Mixcloud. I'm gonna link it below uh, under the show description. You guys can check it out. Um, so the, the final Friday that I played at, at, at the Alibi. At the moment, I haven't got a track list set up for it just yet. So please bear with me. I'll get a track list up very, very soon. But if you can hear it in the background here as I'm play as I'm gonna as I'm kind of listening or I'm kind of talking through the microphone, I play it a little bit so you guys can hear it. Can you hear this? Yeah. So as you can hear, that's me playing at the Alibi Final Friday. It's up it's up on now on Mixcloud. You can go to my profile, which is mixcloud.com forward slash DJ Agostino all one word for mixcloud.com forward slash DJ Agostino but I'll have it linked below on the show notes so you guys can check it out but that was me playing had a very 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 good time and I'll play a little bit for you now and I'll come back again in a minute actually you know what you can listen to it yourself later so that was that. That was me playing at the at the alibi. Really, really good occasion. Happy I've got a picture. Um, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Asking for a picture for somebody to take you behind the booth is a little bit contrived, right? It's a little bit try hard, a little bit corny. I feel a little bit out. I feel a little bit weird saying to anyone, "Oh, can you take a picture of me whilst I'm DJing?" It's a bit weird. So, um, I was I used to think some. I used to. I had I had this idea maybe of just like taking my little because I've got a little tripod. Um, a little mini one of just taking that with me and kind of like putting it in the corner while some DJ and just p playing some videos. Um, that might be a good idea, but you you know, I rarely, I rarely if ever have the time or the wherewithal to kind of like give someone my phone to take a picture of me. It's not something I'm really usually thinking about at that time. So uh, maybe, maybe not so much, but who knows? But it's good to have a picture. At least people can see in a while that what you, you don't know what you do. Cause you know, people in the scene have a tendency to kind of, um, what do you call it? Pretend that, they don't know what you do. I mean, they're, they're pretending that you're not really about. I mean, I'm about, bruv. I, I do this thing for real, for real. Um, but it's good to have, like, you know, picture proof out there. Like, hey, motherfuckers, you know what I mean? I also play music, and I am better than most of you guys out there. I'm sorry. Sorry to say that, but that's the truth. Fuck out of here. Anyway, um, next on the fucking show notes, what do we have here? Um, I love Serena, but I'm happy she lost. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, Serena Williams lost against um, that um, Japanese girl called Osaka. I forgot her first name. Um, and, you know, like, um, it's been weird, isn't it? The 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 the, 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 the backing of Serena now um, during the US Open has been very strange because it feels as if, like, the culture overall has just realized how amazing she is as an athlete or how amazing the Williams sisters are. And it's something that I've been a bit shocked by because, you know, she's been amazing for a long, long, long time. She's been marketable for a very, very long time. If It could be argued she was even more marketable when they were both at their peak, right? Venus and Serena were both playing really at the highest level. They were probably one, two of the most marketable athletes you, you could have, especially, you know, they def, you know they weren't your conventional looking tennis stars. They came from a very up, rough upbringing. They had a father who was kind of like always in their corner and backing them. They were just, you know, sometimes they'd be in a final or big, you know, tennis tournaments facing each other. Like, they were, they, that was a very, very, very unique story. Um, and I never got, and anyway, maybe it's just like a, it's a cycle. But then I guess, you know, now with, with her being married to the founder of Reddit and having a child, maybe it's another cycle that's kind of popped up again. And now she, it seems that she's taking a bit of a stance and being a little bit of an activist, which is everyone's doing at the moment. It's kind of annoying, but I kind of get it. But it's been a bit nauseating, the kind of backing that she's been getting lately. But then also in the back of it, I also understand because, you know, she got criticized for wearing that um, full body sort of cat suit during a, a tennis tournament. And one of the tennis federation guys came out and said, this is not something acceptable uh, to wear in tennis and they're going to enforce a uniform rule. 
uh, for the most part, so you can't wear those kind of outfits, you know. And it's it's annoying, but that's that's the way these kind of like storied sort of like old school French um, federations are. They're very old school. Um, they're very set in their ways. Um, they're not very open to new uh, technologies or that sort of thing. So it's, I don't and I didn't really prescribe the idea that it was any sort of colorism or anything to do with um, a gender bias or anything. I just think these guys are like old fuddy duddies and they just can't bear the thought of seeing a woman in a full clenched on body and a full body con uh cat suit but they don't mind seeing women playing in really short skirts like given the illusion that they've got on nothing underneath but they do have that obviously they have like um cycling shorts or you know running shorts underneath it but they don't mind people wearing short sh um kind of like you know short skirts and tight tops but they don't want them to wear full body um compression sort of like suits which doesn't make any sense again so I get I get the kind of like battle and Nike kind of, you know, having a campaign with her about just do it. Um, when people say no, you say yes, all that sort of shit. But the coverage of her has been a bit nauseating, especially since Osaka is like a really, really young, uh, talented prospect. And, it, you know, there wasn't that much respect given to her in the press. And as per usual, as you know, with sports, this is always the case, I think, in general. Um, the team that's always lauded and built upon, you know, and said that they're the greatest and they're going to do this and they're going to smash those opponents and no one's going to touch them. What generally happens when they finally come up to the match day? What generally happens when they rock up to the court? What generally happens when they take the swing? They generally miss, generally. And, you know, unfortunately, Serena Williams lost the US Open, Osaka won. And, uh, you know, as per usual, because the narrative was already written in the press that Serena Williams was going to win this and show that, you know, you can be a mother and you can be an athlete and you can be an activist and you can be a wife and that sort of malarkey they were going to run with. That narrative got absolutely stripped or kind of like pulled under for money of their feet. And the crowd, you know, decided to start booing Osaka when her name came up. It's like, these guys are horrible. Absolutely pathetic. I've got a little video of it now. I see I saw on, I saw on Twitter about it. I'll kind of show you guys. You guys can check it out yourself. But I thought it was quite disgusting, to be honest, right? So, um, <clears throat> some uh, this guy on on Twitter uh, put a video up. He's what's his name? Um, I'll put it up on the show notes. But it's uh, at Kyle Griffin one. So Kyle Griffin, Griffin spelled G R I F F I N one. He's got a video of uh, Serena putting her arm around Naomi no Osaka as the crowd boos. Is quite a moment via ESPN. So I'm gonna play it out loud now so you guys can hear it. Trophy celebration of the United States Open. Gentlemen and fans, if you would, a hand for the two competitors who played in this finals match tonight. Horrendous, isn't it, right? Like, imagine, right? The biggest day of her life, right? And these, these bloody, stupid, knee-jerk reaction bandwagony tennis fans decided to boo her because Serena Williams didn't win and the Nike narrative couldn't be continued. Like, come on, man, get over it. Serena Williams had, has had her, has had an amazing run in tennis, right? An amazing run. Like, like, honestly, so dominating, especially during her peak. She's what now, 36 years old, right? For her to still be performing at this level anyway, to be reaching US Open finals and competing against some of these young, hungry whippersnappers is, is an absolutely amazing achievement as it is. I'm sure, again, I'm sure someone Serena Williams isn't going to accept the fact that she's just um, in the conversation as a victory. She wants to win. But come on, man. Let's give the girl, let's give her girl her, her time to shine too. It's not that she's like a divisive figure. She wasn't like, you know, waving or pointing a middle finger at everyone and sticking her tongue out. She just won the game. Like, you know, it was a tight game, very highly contested. There was a few maybe dodgy calls but it just always happens in tennis this is what the way it is you know maybe Serena kind of lashing out didn't obviously help Naomi either because the side the, you know she kind of like made a narrative like maybe she was um, cheated in the result and stuff but I'm just not a fan of it man I think it's super super annoying and um, I'm, I'm kind of happy again like that kind of narrative got ripped from underneath her feet and in the same respect too I'm happy that um, Tyron Woodley won too right um, yesterday at UFC 228 Tyron Woodley beat Darren Till um, that was another um, story written again in the press or written in the MMA media that Darren Till, this young, hungry prospect, 25 years old, he came off the back of, you know, um, he beat, what, Wonderboy Thompson, he beat uh, Cowboy, he just, you know, looked absolutely dominating against Cowboy, um, Donald Cowboy Cerrone, um, 
gave uh, Stephen Thompson a real run for his game. But even some people would argue that maybe he didn't win on points. And then suddenly he's thrust into a limelight and given Tyron Woodley. Now, in my in my opinion, humble opinion, I think UFC are, are kind of always throwing their young Cambridge prospects to the Lions, right? There's no real uh, fighter management. There's no real... Um, there's no real cultivating of a career. They just kind of throw you to the wolves as soon as you've got any sort of like clout. And again, there's a little sub story there because Dana White hates Tyron Woodley or doesn't really get on well with him. They're kind of like both kind of at loggerheads. Uh, mostly it seems like because Tyron Woodley isn't one of the fighters who's who's kind of like repeated that line of anyone, anywhere, right? Um, whenever he's given a last minute fight, he never he never accepts it because he's obviously he's a champion. He's got a little bit of leeway and because it's not, doesn't make good business sense to accept a fight on last minute notice, especially if you haven't trained uh, for the fighter in mind. It doesn't make any sort of sense. And there was a subplot story going on in the background that if Darren Till didn't make weight, that Kamaru Usman was um, one of the standbys waiting to take his place. But Tom Woodley stated quite categorically that if Darren Till doesn't make weight, he's still going to fight him. If he wants to fight, no, obviously not for the belt, but if he doesn't want to fight for the belt, then he's not going to fight anyone. And that kind of obviously fu- um, rubbed up the, the Dana White the wrong way. And again, through the post interviews before UFC 228, um, Dana White was making the comments again and again and again that he was, you know, favoring basically Darren Till in the fight. And I'm just glad, I'm just glad that Tyron Woodley was able to kind of silence the critics and prove everyone wrong. And he did it in the most exhilarating fashion. Um, the fight itself started off very, very cagey. The first round, they were kind of both feeling each other out. But what was very evident um, from like minute one of the first round was that uh, Till wasn't able to land any significant strikes. He wasn't as um, in physically imposing as he usually is when he usually fights against people, especially when he saw him fight against uh, a Donald Cerrone, right, Cowboy, he closed the distance a lot better and he was able to kind of smother him with that kind of lead hand that he does where he kind of blocks, he kind of like gets the feel of where you are and then kind of snaps forward with the left. But he wasn't able to do that with um, with uh, Tyron Woodley because he knew the moment he kind of leant forward and and went with a right or with a left, he was going to leave himself exposed. And because um, Tyron Woodley is so quick, has so many fast twitch muscles, muscle fibers, he can probably pop back and forward really quickly at the speed of light before you know it and you're out. So there was, that, there was that thing playing in his mind a lot. And then what Tyron Woodley did as well that was very interesting, he went in for the clench and went for the takedown a couple of times and he kind of uh, instilled a bit of doubt in, ter- in Darren Till's mind that if you do if you, if you you do kind of rest back, I can get you in a clench. You get him in a clench very, very easily. And for some reason, the referees started to break up. I don't understand that. Like the clench is an actual, that's a very hard move to pull off. Um, it's a It's a point of, it's a point of contact where you can inflict some damage. You can kind of, um, you can, um, what do you call it? You can put your opponent in different positions all, all along, all around the ring. It's not something that you just use to kind of rest. It's not like in a, in, in boxing where the clench is kind of used to kind of regain some, regain some, um, some energy, get your breath back and kind of, you know, move around a little bit. You can't really do much in a clench in boxing, especially if you don't have any distance in between each other. But with MMA, you can trip the person, you can push them up up against the cage, you can kind of smother them with your chest in terms of like stopping their breathing patterns. Like those are things that you can do. And the referee kept breaking them up. I don't understand what that, why that was happening. But anyway, that happened. You broke them up a few times and Again, no significant strikes for Darren Till in the whole entire round. And the second round started, and it started off the same way. And then out of nowhere, um, um, you saw you saw what you saw. Tyron Woodley wanted to do. He was just waiting, timing his his, his um, right hand, waiting for Darren Till to expose himself. And the moment he did, he's going to snap in there. And he did. He caught him with a right. Um, Darren Till fell immediately to the floor. He followed up with loads of hammer fists, kind of banging away. Um, he got him with some amazing slicing uh, elbows, that, which kind of opened up a little bit of a uh, cut on the top of I think Darren Till's head, and he was bleeding from it, from uh, bleeding quite a lot profusely. And he thought the fight was going to be over, and he thought maybe um, Tyron Woodley was going to gas himself out. But you know, he's got an amazing cardio, amazing, amazing energy. He was able to kind of conserve his energy, and then maybe he was able to kind of like, kind of like you know, take it a bit easy, time some of his hammer fists coming down. And then out of nowhere, again, I, w- I had no idea how good um, Tyron Woodley's jujitsu was. He was slowly but surely um, working in a choke, moving around. Darren Till was so was so kind of concerned about the the, the punches, and I was a little I was a little bit more I was, I was surprised of how bad Darren Till did with his back, um, um, being on his back, uh, considering that he grew up in Portugal. 
I mean, sorry, considering he grew, up, he grew up in Brazil for most of his youth, I think he got sent there when he was kind of getting in trouble in England here. And he, and he did most of his um, MMA and Muay Thai training in Brazil. And he speaks fluent Portuguese. But I, can, I, was, I was really surprised of how bad he did with his, um, on his back. Now, maybe, you know, being smothered by Tyron Woodley is not the easiest, um, especially, you know, when he's got a full mount. But I was surprised how bad he did on his back. He wasn't really blocking or countering well from the floor. And then um, along that, somewhere along that period, um, uh, Tyron Woodley was able to sink a choke in with a dash choke and the fight was over. I've got a little clip of it now that I want to show you guys. I, I, I've loaded on my on my Twitter page, which kind of shows the final minutes of the fight. But yeah, I was happy for Tyron Woodley, man. Super, 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 super happy for the guy. So as you can see here, he's got him in a dash. He's slowly but surely sinking that bad boy in. Getting some distance, cranking it, twisting his head, pushing the forearm into his chest, and then bang, he taps, and it's over. And he just gets up like nothing happened. Oh, I love Tyron Woodley so much, man. He walked off and he wasn't even breathing that hard. Like, amazing, amazing fight, man. So that, and again, the whole card was fucking banging. There was, a, there was some really, really good knockouts in the card. The card on paper looked absolutely boring, but fair play, man. UC228 was absolutely amazing. So, yeah, well, big up to Tyron Woodley for getting the job done. And still, still, still the champion, the best ever at 178 pounds. Um, Maybe, Dan, I don't sure what, what, what's next for Darren Till. Hopefully, he moves up a little bit. I think the weight cut kind of took it out of him for the most part. Um, he did look a lot bigger coming into the ring, though, uh, prior to the weigh-ins. But maybe, uh, hopefully, he's able to go up a weight class. And again, just take your time a little bit. He doesn't need to be rushed in and be facing champions straight away. He should need to he needs to take his time a little bit more. Um, what well, the UT should be allow him to kind of like, you know, work his way up the ladder instead of being, being thrown straight to the walls. But, you know, say la vie. And yeah, UC 228 was fucking amazing. I was sad not to see the Valentino Shachenko fight, though. Um, but anyway... What can you do? What's next on the docket? Um, <laughs> oh, have you guys seen the Kanye um, Pornhub Award t-shirts? They look fairly good. I wouldn't mind a, a couple of pair, a couple of these. Um, you know, what's her name? Launching. Oh, okay. Is this the... What they, what, why they got the launch pad for this? Okay, I didn't know this actually. They usually said we usually boost seven hundred. Like, what are they launching again? September fifteenth. So that's coming up on, on Friday. That's quite nice. So you can get another pair again if I want to. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Who knows? But let's see. The the new UZ Pornhub t-shirts came out the other day, and they're fairly cool looking. Are they? Are they all out already? Maybe they all sold out. Oh no, they're all gone. They're all gone. Yeah, it seems like they're all gone. I think so. Maybe men. Yeah, they were gone, I think. No more Pornhub t-shirts. But yeah, they had a couple Pornhub t-shirts that they were selling for the porn awards that Kanye West did. I'm sure now they're probably all finished, it seems like, unfortunately. Okay, okay. That's no problem. Um, Anyway, moving on. London Nightlife moves on. This interesting article that popped up on Vice that I thought was quite interesting. Um, I'm going to get it up on here on the screen, guys. And check it out. Again, I'll link it all in the show notes. Um, is the, the title on Vice... Reads, London nightlife's not dead, it's just on the move. As two of Dawson's most iconic venues close and Hackney gets increasingly hostile to a new venue, we just need to look slightly further afield, which I 100% agree with. So, uh, at the end of August, two of London's most iconic and long standing late license venues, the Alibi and Visions, announced that they will be closing their doors for good. Across East London, people who spend their teens and 20s sweating in the basement bars and throwing up a Kingsland Road mourn the great, the, these great losses. The statements came as kickers to more recent bad news for the area. The announcement in late July that Hackney Council is going to be implementing a, night, a midnight curfew for all new clubs and bars, meaning any new venues opening in the borough will have to argue against an 11 pm closing time during the week and a midnight curfew in the weekends. Re reactions to the curfew were understandably heated given the fact that Hackney has for years been the representative of London nightlife want to get plastered until 1am bardens fancy drink dancing to generally not shit music until sunrise Oslo and in the mood for the worst night of your life drinking espresso martinis with a load of recruiters in a multicolored ball pit shortage barley balson um many criticize london night night london night is uh, amy lammy who's been very quiet after i didn't know right she's not said a fucking word 
uh, for apparent inactivity silence and silence on the issue as well as hackney council for their flagrant disregard uh, of their own consolation pro cons consultation process 75 percent of the residents hackney said they consulted about the curfew against the plans speaking to the owners of both the divisions and the by this move a token of hackney's increasing custody towards the clubs and bars that so many developers have used as bait to entice potential buyers to the area seems to have played a role in both closures <coughs> and it says the court continues we close voluntarily due to noise and antisocial behavior outside the venue uh, explains joel evans which i'm happy they said out right because if you've been to visions in the last few years you'll know that as great as it is it's a great place to go to listen to hip-hop because you know i don't necessarily um I don't necessarily like going to hip hop clubs because usually they usually play the same old shit, right? It's always the same kind of 80s, 90s stuff and then into some early 2000s and that's it, right? But the good thing about Visions is that they used to play like current music, like stuff that's out now, like a Playboy Carti, like a Trippy Red, like a Lil Uzi Vert, like an ASAP Rocky, like Tyler. They used to play like current stuff, which I love to hear. So if you want to hear that stuff out loud in public, that's a place to go. Now there's a few more places to go to that my brothers go um, in Shoreditch, but you know, they, they're kind of populated by quite a younger crowd, but Visions was a lot more of a diverse kind of urban a lot more of an a lot more of an older urban crowd so it was a little bit better but you can't get around the fact that there was a lot of trouble love argy bargy in that place i'm happy they said that um the, the article continues there has been an increasing there's been increased antisocial behavior around dawson and a, a decrease in policing budgets to tackle this and long-term plan by the local council to bring better housing and business into the area because by definition operate and anti antisocial hours and so are uh, caught in the midst so we are caught in the middle of this which is very um Roundy thing to say. In essence, our good our crew got priced out. Says Alibi Corona Dino. We were still going to ride it out and invest even more cash because we love Dawson and the bar so much. But after the council announcing there will be no new light license granted, we realized that people and businesses like just like us, like us, just weren't welcome in Hackney anymore. Um, I contacted Amy Lamy office for her thoughts on the club closures, but she didn't get back to me. Twenty hours after Hackney Council's policy announcement, she tweeted that she had demanded an urgent meeting. Man, she's fucking fuck Amy Lamy. Um, when I asked um, Galvin, the, London, the Hackney Mayor, about the closure of Visions, he responded, they're, they're, these are two important venues familiar to, for, to me from Nightside and Dawson, but the council's new licensing policy doesn't affect current um, much-loved businesses like Alibi and Visions, we have, uh, who, who have already been granted late licenses. Instead, it aims to support new, well-managed businesses to enter the borough's nightlife economy. It's always sad to see a business go, but this is a decision by the bars themselves. But we will fully expect these spaces to continue to serve Hackney and its nighttime economy under new management after speaking to many club owners in hackney and london wide but however it's clear that galvin optimism for the future of hackney light life is, isn't shared much of hackney's nighttime economy was built around a group of people who just aren't there anymore says explains um coroner mark Schiffer. hackney council is somewhat um on an easy target at the moment and i don't want to add to the cause but without getting into the possible reasons why there appear to be a complete lack of strategic thinking during the rapid growth of dawson and equally rapid decline i said that before right there, there wasn't a clear they were, they were allowing all these clubs to open up in residential areas, allowing all these um, new bills to also follow suit. And then, of course, the people that live there were going to get irate because, you know, you're building clubs right next to where they live. The houses where they live don't have adequate soundproofing, so they're hearing all these fucking shit that's going on in the strip. So there's a real big loggerheads that came towards it. And then you're also selling the area <clears throat> based upon the bars and clubs that are in that area. But then the people that live in the area aren't necessarily vibing with it because it's disturbing them and they can't sleep well um and it continues um but i'm convinced that hackney council was equipped to make any kind of difference they offered a little no support and were consistently obtrusive to lessen policy and rather than challenging extra resources solidifying the area's reputation they failed to sustain it and protect it however in all fairness hackney council is simply exhibiting the flaws of any large organizations impeded by its own system and bureaucracy which is very very true um so yeah, the, the, the article continues. It's a really long article. You can check it out. It's got pictures from the very last karaoke at the Alibi, which I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed I didn't end up going to. But yeah, I was able to go on the final Friday, which was a nice event to kind of close out the chapter. But yeah, Hackney, um, the London Life Life is still on the rise. If you want to go out, you just have to kind of venture a bit further further north, like the cause. Obviously, places like Five Miles, places like the Fold that I went to in Canning Town, the 24-hour club. There's places that you can go to. You can follow people on uh like keep on going keep it keep keep it going keep on going on facebook's a group that have parties that they do from friday to sunday there's a party in the woods that have loads of other kind of illegal raves that they do in forest raves that you can kind of find out too when you sign up to the private group there are things happening but you kind of have to keep your 
eye on the prize. And if anything, you know, there's going to be a resurgence. There's going to be another wave of new things popping up. We just have to kind of ride out this storm. That's what I think is going to happen. For the most part, I think so. Don't don't judge me. Don't judge. Don't shoot the messenger. But I think that's what's going to happen. So anyway, um, I have to jet off because I've got to go to work. This is the episode number one three of the Excellent Zingers, 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 Zingers. This is one of three Excellent Zingers show. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm gonna see you guys again tomorrow. It's been a pleasure to have you back again in front of me and um i guess love and kiss the people that you love or kiss and love the people that you don't love and then i'm gonna see you guys again on the other side tomorrow sharp and whatever wish me luck first day back after tonsillitis hopefully i don't throw up all over myself peace